John Noe unveils Greater Than We Believe with your host, Stephen King. Well, hello there. This is Stephen King and my friend John Noe. We are bringing you another in a continuing series of Bible study videos. The series is called Greater Than We Believe. And uh, John and I have covered subjects, everything from Bible prophecy and eschatology to the kingdom to the return of Jesus and so forth and so on. So many things. Here lately we were, I've been talking on uh, a subject that started in this book called Hell Yes, Hell No. And we had a, a whole section there devoted to uh, teachings and understanding hmm. Whether or not the hell doctrine is being taught by the church is really biblical or not. Mm -hmm. And then we've taken that discussion on. We're still working out of the book, but we've actually changed the playlist name. Now the name of this series is called The All Controversy. And this week, the name of the show is uh, No Condemnation. So, John, catch us up. Tell us where we stand. And uh, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> Well, if you think we walked up the street to the local church and walked in there and started talking about some of this stuff. Well, they'd show us the door. <laughs> Do you think there'd be any condemnation? Uh, there would be condemnation, yes. Okay. Well, why wasn't there any combination, condemnation Excuse me, back then? Because none of the four great general councils of the church held back during the first 500 years of mm -hmm. church's history, uh, none of them held any condemnation against this Christian universalism view. None whatsoever. Or ever addressed, named, or condemned uh, the, the uh, proponents of it mm -hmm. for being heretical. Uh, although they did so for many other prevailing heresies of that day mm -hmm. and time. But not this one. Isn't that something? Interesting. So it wasn't, it, it wasn't like they were not condemning at all. They were other heresies. Yes. But this was not one of them. They didn't consider it a heresy. No. None of the early church fathers that we previously mentioned in the last video, for example, or others were ever denounced by the church for espousing a heresy in regard to their belief of universal salvation or post-mortem purification and conversion. Mm -hmm. No creed or declaration of Christian opinions during this same period contained anything contradictory toward this or incompatible or, conde or condemned it, uh, the, this doctrine of universal salvation. And no word or hint of endless punishment and or torment for anyone in the afterlife is contained in any of the church creeds. Mm. Irenaeus, uh, A.D. 120 to 202, in his principal work against heresies, did not include universalism as mm. one of the heresies. Mm. Isn't that something? Mm. Nowhere. Was it, was it named or condemned as a heretical belief during the first 500 years of Christian history? Others, such as Irenaeus and Hippolytus, uh, also uh, who wrote against prevailing heresies of their day and time, mm -hmm. never named. Universalism is one of them. Thus, Shelley, in his book, Church history in, in plain language uh, stated for more than 500 years during which universalism had prevailed, not a single treatise against it is known to have been written. And with the exception of Augustine, which we'll get into yes. shortly, uh, no opposition appears to have been aroused against it on part of any eminent Christian writer. Isn't that something? Hmm. But many of Origen's others, other teachings were condemned as her errors. But his doctrine of universal salvation never 
was mentioned or condemned. Wow. Then we have many teachings of the three what's called Gnostic sets, sects, excuse me, that flourished during the second century, all of which accepted universal salvation uh, and were in full agreement with Clement and Origen and the Alexandria School, and their teachings were bitterly opposed by the, by the Orthodox Fathers, but their universalism was never condemned. Hmm. And of course, some, as I've mentioned, and, and during this time, did teach endless punishment for a portion of, of humankind, and others taught several uh, versions of annihilationism for the, for the wicked and afterlife, but they were in the minority. Mm -hmm. And notably, the church did not rebuke them either. So neither. Mm -hmm. no, nobody in this was condemned or rebuked. Nor, nor did they dogmatize on man's final, final destiny as we do today. Right. Therefore, Stetson, in his book, uh, in the, about the first century, said that the concept of eternal damnation or tormenting in hell was largely unheard of among Christians, especially those of the Jewish background, mm -hmm. who knew this was not taught in the Hebrew Scriptures. It only gradually came to be believed by some Christians in the second and third centuries, catch this, as more Gentiles from Greco-Roman background mm -hmm. converted to the faith of Christianity, bringing some of their pagan ideas along with them. Mm -hmm. Wow. Poisoning the well. Wow. And although... The doctrine of endless punishment for the wicked was not fully developed until Protestantism, i.e. Luther, mm -hmm. in, in the 1500s, for example. Prayers for the dead and the wicked dead were widely practiced in the early church. And modern day, Hansen, says Hansen documents, modern day uh, Universals argue that this practice would have been absurd if their condition is unalterably fixed at the grave. Hmm. Thus, the early church was molded, guided, and sustained by the influence and power of universalism for the first 500 years. And it represents, again, according to universalist writer Hansen, and it represents the prevailing religion or religious faith of the three of the three first and three best centuries of the church, mm. which was accused of turning the world of their day upside and time down. upside down. <laughs> Acts seventeen six King James version, which was most remarkable for its simplicity, goodness, and missionary zeal mm -hmm. back then. And the, and the major belief was Christian universalism. Yes. Ah. So, modern-day universalists appropriately ask, why didn't a single church council for the first 500 years condemn universal salvationism mm -hmm. when they condemn many other teachings and heresies? Good point, don't you think? Yes. Why didn't a single Christian writer of the first three centuries of Christianity declare universalism a heresy? Hmm. Why didn't a single early creed express an idea to the contrary and mention everlasting endless punishment? Mm -hmm. To the contrary, early Christianity was a religion of sweetness and light, mm. according to again, Hansen, <laughs> yeah. and a religion of joy, not gloom, of life and not death. But this kind of Christianity would soon begin to change drastically mm -hmm. because of Augustinian 354 to 430 AD and onward mm -hmm. and ripen into the Roman Catholic Church and the Popery. Yes. All right. Let's talk about what I call the rise of opposition. 
during the second and third centuries, Stephen, a guy by the name of Tertullian, 160 to 220, uh, and the African school in Carthage, located in Africa, that's yes. why it's called the African school, obviously, had, had, had been the main exception to the almost total void of any opposition and condemnation of the doctrine of universal, uh, uh, Christian universalism. Tertullian, it is believed, was probably, and this comes again from Hansen, Hansen's book, Tertullian was, was probably the first of the fathers to assert that the torments of the lost will be of equal duration with the happiness of the saved, end quote. And yet somewhat inconsistently in his 50 arguments for the Christian religion, not once did he state that endless punishment was one of those doctrines. Mm. And he speaks of the sinner as being able after death to, quote, Pay the utmost farthing, mm. end quote, after death. It is also documented that Tertullian and other prominent defenders of the doctrine of endless punishment were reared as heathens mm. and even confessed to having lived corrupt and vicious lives in their youth. Additionally, he had a pagan education in Roman law and rhetoric, but he lived a heathen into mature manhood and confessed that his life had been one of vice and lasciviousness. And after converting, again, this is this guy. Mm -hmm. And after converting to Christianity in later years, however, he lived a moral and religious life. But the heathen doctrines he retained uh, rendered his spirit harsh and bitter, according to Hansen. So Universalists further claim that the great transition of Christianity to churchianity may be said to have begun with Constantine, the emperor, the Roman emperor, yes. Constantine, 272 to 3. 37, who legalized Christianity as the in the Roman Empire in A.D. 313 at, at the beginning of the 4th century. But according to Universalist, again, Hansen, mm -hmm. uh, this dramatic change also brought in, quote, <clears throat> pagan principles by the masses that modified and corrupted the religion of Christ. Schaff, in his book, The History of the Christian Church, again, this one's at the Christian Theological Seminary, so I just had to do a printout of the, of the cover, negatively notes that from the time of the Constantine Church, dis, uh, uh, discipline declines, and the whole Roman world had, had become nominally Christian, and the host of hypocritical professors multiplied beyond control. And then along comes Augustine, mm -hmm. A.D. 354 to 430. And according to Hansen again, uh, the Universalist charged that he was a great fountain of error, mm -hmm. quote, unquote, destined to adulterate Christianity and change its character uh, for long ages and many centuries. And from a personal character standpoint, he informs us himself that he spent his youth in a, botro, in a, in a brothel. Brothel, okay. Can't pronounce the word. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in Carthage, after a mean and thieving boyhood, and he cast off the mother of his illegitimate son, whom he brought, who he ought to have married, as his sainted mother urged him to do. And his mother allowed him to live at home during his shameless life, mm. but that when he adopted the Machian uh, heresy, she forbade him to live in her house, and afterwards, when he became orthodox, though still living immorally, she received him back into his home, mm. into her home. And most notably, again, according to Hansen, most notably, Augustine changed the language of Christianity from Greek hmm. to Latin. Latin. 
all of which, universalists say, brought about distortions and corruption of prior Christian truth claims. Mm -hmm. Introducing a long train of errors and evils and subverted the current belief in mm -hmm. universal salvationism, cherished by Clement, Origen, and the Alexandria, and Alexandria Christians. Amazingly, however, Augustine did not know Greek. <laughs> this he confesses. He says, he said, he hates Greek. This is quoted from some of his writings. And admits that he had learned nothing of Greek and was not competent to read and understand the language. So Hansen added, adds and laments that, uh, let's see, do I want you to read this? Yeah, I want you to read this. Or do I? Mm -hmm. No, I don't. Or do I? Yeah. I marked it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry. Would you read what, what, what Hansen says about this guy? In no other respect did Augustine differ more widely from Origen and the Alexandrians than in his intolerant spirit. But he afterwards came to advocate and defend the persecution of religious opponents. He was the first in a long line of Christian persecutors to advocate the right to persecute Christians who differ from those in power. <clears throat> Excuse me. Augustine was the first and ablest asserter of the principle which led to um, Albin, Albig, Albigen's Albigen's sin crusades, mm. <laughs> Spanish armadas, Netherlands butcheries, St. Bartholomew massacres, the accursed infamies of the Inquisition, the vile espionage, the hideous, hideous bale fires of Seville and Smithfield, the racks, the gibbets, the thumbscrews, the subterranean torture chambers used by churchly, churchly torturers. Was that page 274 and 275? No, it's 280 and 281. Oh, okay. I was going to say uh, pages 274 and 275. Do, do I have that marked? No. I didn't. Okay, okay. All right. Well, here's what they say. Here's, okay. here's what he wrote in that, and I'll read this one. All right. Because I didn't mark that one for you. That such a man, speaking of Augustine again, we are speaking of Augustine here. Augustine, yes. Such a man should contradict and subvert the teachings of such men as Clement and Origen and the Gregories and others whose mother tongue was Greek is passing strange. But his powerful influence aided by the civil arm and, and established his doctrine until it came to rule the centuries. And that was a doctrine of universal salvation. Universalists further, further charge that Augustine's hatred and misunderstanding of foreign language brought in the mistranslations of the original Greek scriptures, and they summarized that the triumph of, the Latin, of Latin theology was the death mm. of rational exegesis. Nevertheless, Stephen, Augustine is the first writer to undertake a long and elaborate defense of the doctrine of endless punishment and to wage a polemic against its impugners, as he termed them. And in doing so, Augustine assumed and insisted that the words defining the, dur defining the duration of punishment in the New Testament teach endlessness and that, that the Latin word aeternus in Latin and aeonus in Greek meant an inter, in, uh, interminable duration of time. When challenged that aeonus in Greek does not de denote eternal, but limited duration, Augustine replied that although aeon, age, signifies a limited as well as endless duration, the Greeks only use aeonos for endlessness. Hmm. But this is not what the early church fathers who were steeped in Greek language taught and what it meant. It meant, it meant a period of time. Yes. Not an endless. Right. Big difference. The difference between the Latin and the Greek. Mm hmm all right. Do you see the problem here in this? Did you follow that? I hope hope you did. Uh, 
And it was the immense power of Augustine that came and wielded such a dominant role over the church and that it afterwards stomped out the doctrine of universal salvation. Hmm. So, Stenson. Hence, Augustine became, quote, the most important church theologian after Origen. Yet he was a man who converted to Christianity from a pagan background, who could not even read Greek, and thus had no command of the language in which the New Testament was written, and in which the early church had read the Bible. And you had already read us. Yes, you had already read us that, that portion of that. So in sum, the early church fathers delivered their universalism directly and solely from the Greek language and how the scriptures were written, but the change to Latin language changed things. Therefore, as Hansen writes, this guy, as Hansen writes, universal salvation was a prevailing doctrine in Christendom as long as the Greek language of the New Testament was the language of Christendom. And universalism was least known when Latin was the language uh, of the church in its darkest and most ignorant and corrupt ages. And the Greek tongue soon becomes unknown in the West, and the Greek fathers forgotten. Even so, as late as 400, Jerome says, quote, Most people, very many, believed in universalism notwithstanding that the tremendous influence of Augustine and the mighty power of the semi-pagan sexual arm arrayed against it. The beginning of condemnation. Mm. And we'll go on from there next week. Things took a downturn, didn't they? <laughs> Thank you, John. So um, the next week, the video there is going to be called Changed to Heretical. This is the stepping stones of, of how... We're the, seeing the transition. Yeah, yeah transition. And yeah, we're going now going from transition. So it's not, like, you know, it's not like universal salvation was a thing that was brought in to the church to, to stand against what they already believed. It was what they started to believe. In yes. this, and Alexander is the one... Well, four of, yeah. four of the six yeah. schools... So, it was a majority view. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I hope we didn't confuse you with any of this. And I know you'll have a lot of questions. And in the long run, we're going to come back to this idea of the all controversy. And that's that's where this is heading uh, to understand what all means. What is all? Well, we'll see. <laughs> so come back and see us next week. Pray for our ministry, please, as, you, as we pray for our the people that watch the show. We just want... Um, we want to know the truth of the word. We want to propone that, uh, be proponents for the truth. And um, mm. remember, too, that um, this isn't salvation stuff here. If you're already saved, you're saved. Well, your belief on this either way is not going to affect your salvation. So it's worthwhile to take for your own quality of life to take the time to... Uh, Go through this, listen to it. You'll still have to make your own decision. You may not agree with what we come up with, and that's fine. I'm not gonna gonna call you names or give you a hard time. <laughs> but uh, it may it changed my life, and I think it will yours too. God bless you. We'll see you next week.